What would become the Great War had been planned for by all the main participants for 30 years. But when it came, it came so quickly, no one felt prepared. It was as though something long anticipated and even hoped for had gotten out of hand before it even began. The reason for this, all agreed, could be summed up in one word, mobilization. Each country knew the mobilization schedule of all the others, how long it would take each army to be ready to march. To be mobilized one day too late was to be a day behind, with potentially disastrous consequences. Of the great powers, only the greatest, the British Empire, could take its time. That was the luxury afforded by the Royal Navy to make Britain impregnable until it was ready to fight. When, on August 4th, German forces struck through Belgium, all the European powers had vast armies in the field. Britain dispatched an expeditionary force of 100,000 to assist the Belgians and French stem the German tide. The German Kaiser, comparing Britain's contribution to the five million from the other great powers, dismissed them as contemptible. When the Austrian Archduke Ferdinand and his wife were assassinated in Sarajevo, the news had little impact in Canada. The day following the assassination, Prime Minister Robert Borden traveled to Halifax to visit his mother for a few days before moving on to Muskoka for a much welcome summer vacation. When Austria held Serbia accountable for the assassination and shelled the capital of Belgrade on July 28th, Russia began mobilizing to defend its ally, Serbia. The Germans, allied with Austria, stood ready to attack Russia, which evoked its alliance with France. Germany remained confident they could win a war on two fronts, against Russia in the east and the real prize, France in the west. In Ottawa, Sam Hughes, Canada's Minister of Militia, had been anxiously awaiting the British response to Germany's declaration of war against France and Russia. England is going to skunk it. They seem to be looking for an excuse to get out of helping France. Oh, what a shameful state of things. By God, I don't want to be a Britisher under such conditions. To think that they would want to go back on France. Sam Hughes. On August 3rd, disgusted by Britain's hesitancy to enter the fray even though Belgium had been invaded, Hughes ordered the Union Jack to be taken down over militia headquarters. But when Britain's ultimatum, demanding Germany cease its invasion of Belgium, expired at midnight on August 4, 1914, the British Empire was at war. Although the events of the past few days had quite prepared us for this result, it came at last as a shock. It was difficult to retain one's balance in the unexpected and bewildering environment that enveloped us in what had seemed but a moment. Robert Borden, Prime Minister. For Grace Morris of Pembroke, July had been a gloriously carefree month, spent canoeing, boating, and playing tennis with her two brothers, Basil and Ramsey and Ramsey's classmate at the University of Toronto, Alf Bastido, who had spent the last month with the Morris family, a great deal of that time in the company of Grace. But her summer of idle pleasure came to an abrupt end on the night of August 4th. We sat tensely on the veranda of our home in Pembroke, Ramsey, Alf, our cousin Sammy, and myself. We were waiting for Basil, the youngest of the group, to return from the telegraph office where he had been sent to read the latest bulletin. As Basil hurried up the steps, he announced breathlessly, war is declared, Canada is at war. Silence. Then someone said, but this is our war. How do you get into a war? I know how I get into it, Alf replied. I leave on the early morning train for home. I am a captain in the militia in Milton. We wondered how long a war could last in this industrial age. A few weeks, possibly. The next morning, we went to the railway station to bid farewell to Alf. Grace Morris. 
Across the nation, it seemed Canadians unanimously welcomed the government's declaration of war. Even Henri Bourassa, the French-Canadian nationalist who was in Europe when the war broke out, published a statement in support of Canada's commitment to the war. Canada, an Anglo-French nation bound to England and to France by a thousand ethnic, social, intellectual and economic ties, has a vital interest in the maintenance of France and England. It is therefore her national duty to contribute to the triumph and above all, to the endurance of the combined effort of France and England. Henri Bourassa. For those of British stock, the question of Canada's involvement was beyond debate. The duty of all Canadians is to share their last drop of blood in defense of the dear old motherland. But why ask such a question? Is there a cur with a drop of British blood in his veins who doubts his duty? Lieutenant Colonel J.A. Vickers, 102nd Regiment, Rocky Mountain Rangers. Though newspapers such as the Calgary Daily Herald preached caution and moderation, incidents of anti-German hysteria erupted throughout the country. In Regina, rioters set fire to nine buildings known to be owned by Germans. In Vancouver, a mob attacked the German consulate. And in Berlin, Ontario, where two-thirds of the population were of German descent, vandals tore down a statue of Kaiser Wilhelm and tossed it into a lake. But Canadians' passion for Britain's cause could not disguise the fact that we had, militarily speaking, little to offer. The job of correcting that state of affairs fell to Sam Hughes, who was, at least in his own eyes, almost uniquely qualified to carry it out. Real civilization was gained by the British Bible and the British bayonet. Sam Hughes. In 1898, a year before the outbreak of the Boer War in South Africa, Hughes pressured the Liberal government under Laurier to provide troops for overseas service. The Liberals dragged their feet. A frustrated Hughes then advertised for volunteers and offered these troops directly to Joseph Chamberlain, the British Secretary of State for the Colonies. General Hutton, British commander of the Canadian militia, sought to punish Hughes for his unauthorized action by refusing him a command in the Canadian contingent to South Africa. Hughes bitterly attacked Hutton in a series of published letters. Let me point out that wherever British regulars have fought with Canadian volunteers side by side, victory has ever been theirs. Whatever disaster occurred in the War of 1812, there were no Canadians. Sam Hughes. Hutton replied, I should fail in my duty if I recommend the employment of an officer, however well-intentioned, whom I now know and whose correspondence shows to be not only devoid of any proper spirit of subordination, but to be also deficient in military judgment. General Edward Hutton. And Hughes was out. Fearing that he might miss the grand adventure altogether, a desperate Hughes apologized to Hutton. Poor Hughes is almost heartbroken and has been to see me twice, full of tears and contrition. The struggle is over. General Edward Hutton. Hutton allowed Hughes to accompany the troops, but only as a civilian. Undaunted, Hughes secured a position as railway staff officer and within a year had become senior intelligence officer for the railway. Hughes wrote a number of letters home describing his exploits, many of which found their way into Canadian newspapers. They were full of condemnation for the British and praise for his own heroic endeavors. It has been my good fortune to make my mark in December in transportation matters. In January and February, in lines of communication affairs all over South Africa. And now, I have, just yesterday morning, relieved the town of Uppington with two Canadians. We rode 68 miles in 24 hours in order to reach here before a large force of the enemy moving on the northern bank of the river, whose object was to destroy the bridge here and loot the shops. On getting to the river, 
After riding all night, I crossed under fire, chased the enemy, numbering 75 in one body and several hundred in another, to cornfields. Before sunset, searched every house in the town and took the arms, and now awaiting the arrival of our troops. Still two days off. Sam Hughes. With the publication of these letters, the press sheepishly dropped their vilification of Hutton and turned on Hughes. The journals which imagined that Colonel Sam Hughes was a victim of General Hutton's prejudice against colonial officers must feel like asking the earth to open up and swallow them when they read those awful letters. The Toronto Telegram. Weary of Hughes' continuing assault on the British High Command in the press, Field Marshal Roberts, the British commander, sent Hughes packing, fueling Hughes' hatred of the British regular army. Imperialism and imperialist are words we hear in constant use in public and private, though frequently those who use them have but a faint conception of their actual meaning. Not everyone is gifted with an imaginative grasp of unseen things, and this is necessary for at least the majority to have if we would build an empire as wide as the world. Elsie Redford. The meaning of dominion status within the British Empire, which also included colonies, dependencies, and protectorates, was perfectly clear for the first 40 years of Canada's existence. It meant independence except for defense. In other words, foreign and military policy. We sense that there is a vague something moving abroad and gradually working its way into the minds of men up and down the earth and that something is the spirit of imperialism. It is fastening itself upon their intelligence in a way that augurs well, for it's crystallizing into form and action. Elsie Redford. Elsie Redford's vague something received a lot of positive reinforcement. We were encouraged to believe that the British Empire was something very special, which had practically been guided by God. We sang, we hold a vaster empire than has been. Nigh half the race of man is subject to our king. Nigh half the world is his in fife, where he rules all are free. Or something like that. We had to memorize these things. Keith Fallis. Sam Hughes had little difficulty separating his deep dislike and mistrust of the British military from an ardent support of imperial unity a term he invented and then proceeded to define in a speech to the Canadian militia in 1913. To make the youth of Canada self-controlled, erect, decent, and patriotic through military and physical training. To give that final touch of imperial unity and crown the arch of responsible government by an imperial parliament dealing with imperial affairs. Sam Hughes. In other words, Hughes' imperial vision saw himself as Canada's representative at the very centre of imperial planning, speaking for Britons abroad. An ardent orangeman, his definition of empire included religion as well as race and nationality. In 1914, he issued an order that militia regiments in Quebec would no longer be permitted to march in parades to mark Catholic holidays. His view of the nature of a new kind of Canadian army went hand in hand with his romantic notions of an imperial parliament, which did not exist, and which few but he had proposed. The Canadian colonies can be completely ignored so far as concerns any European theater of war. General Friedrich von Bernhardi, German General Staff. After he had toured Canada in 1910 as Inspector General, Sir John French, who would lead the British Expeditionary Force in France, evaluated the effectiveness of Canada's militia 
should war come. At present, it would not be possible to put the militia into the field in a condition to undertake active operations until after the elapse of a considerable period. Sir John French, Inspector General. Sam Hughes had been appointed in 1911 to remedy the situation. But by August 1914, the permanent force numbered only 3,110, all ranks, and the Navy, 393. The militia, scorned by Sir John French, numbered 64,000. Germany, an autocracy backed by strong military power, required every physically fit male to train for military service, for which they would remain liable to age 45. Between August 6th and August 16th, 1914, more than three million German soldiers moved to the front in 11,000 trains. Sam Hughes' first act was to drop mobilization plans drawn up only three years earlier, opting, as he told Parliament, for improvisation. Really a call to arms, like the fiery cross passing through the highlands of Scotland or the mountains of Ireland in former days. Sam Hughes. He sent 296 night telegrams to the colonels of the militia, encouraged, no doubt, by the fine sentiments many of them had expressed in a survey conducted by the Montreal Star. As for myself and the Rangers, we are ready. Just let Colonel Sam give the word. Lieutenant Colonel J.A. Vickis, 102nd Regiment, Rocky Mountain Rangers. We share the Empire's protection and should gladly share her dangers. Lieutenant Colonel M.S. Mercer, Queen's Own Rifles. There is only one option. Not only Canadians, but every British subject should rally around the flag and perpetuate the glorious traditions of the Empire. Lieutenant Colonel James W. Woods, Governor General's Horse Guard. Sam Hughes' mobilization plan successfully outflanked and bypassed the divisional and district commands and left everything in his hands. The result was a bureaucratic nightmare. At Sam Hughes' insistence, the Canadian Army formed battalions that had little connection with traditional regiments, which nonetheless remained responsible for most of the cost of recruiting. Wealthy patrons sponsored whole units and battalions. Hamilton Galt, at a cost of $100,000, raised and equipped the Princess Patricia Light Infantry, which would be the first Canadian unit to see action. The stress on private funding of the mobilization had serious repercussions in Quebec, where English regiments, mainly in Montreal, Canada's richest city, found ready sponsors, while few French Canadians possessed the wealth to keep pace. Hughes was also reluctant to encourage French-speaking units, allowing members of the Carbonnière Montréal, the Voltigeur de Quebec, and the Carbonnière de Sherbrooke to be absorbed in the 12th and 14th battalions, both English-speaking. Prominent French-Canadian officers, such as General Lassard and Colonel Pelletier, were passed over. Pelletier, who commanded an infantry column in South Africa, was given command of a half-dozen men defending Anacosti Island in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Randolph Lemieux and Dr. Omer Migros, both wealthy Quebecers, decided to raise a French-speaking battalion. But getting Hughes' permission required strenuous efforts on the part of 58 liberal and conservative members of parliament from Quebec. The result was the 22nd Battalion, which became the Royal 22nd, the Van Dues, destined to be Canada's most decorated regiment. Hughes' mobilization violated the provisions of the Militia Act which since Confederation had maintained a balance of French and English units. Early recruitment, spurred by the belief that the war would be glorious and short, helped to ensure that only one French-speaking company would be part of the 35,000 men dispatched to England in September 1914. Thus, as the war progressed, there would be few experienced French-speaking officers. On August 7, 1914, La Presse, the largest French daily, made an impractical suggestion, which provides evidence of just how negative the effect of the Imperial connection was. 
now that France and England are fighting side by side, why does the Canadian government not obtain the authority to raise French-Canadian regiments to be enrolled under the flag of France? La Presse. Later, to help cure the shortage of French-Canadian recruits, Hughes turned to his old buddy and Conservative Party organizer, William Price, who found few French-Canadians willing to follow an English colonel with no military experience. I can see now that there will be difficulty in raising many men in this province. The organization is rotten, and there is a complete misunderstanding as to how to get French Canadians to enlist. William Price. Price's own methods were not calculated to produce a better result. I tell them what no politician dares tell them, that they're behind all the other provinces, though they have double duty, one to the empire and another to France. Yet they are laggards, and that they should, as a matter of fact, furnish more than any other province. William Price. Hughes' methods would raise the largest volunteer army to fight in the Great War, and perhaps the largest volunteer force in the history of human conflict. But his personal reputation in Quebec was not enhanced when two civilians, one a tramp, another a French national returning to his regiment in France, were shot and killed in response to an order from Hughes that sentries at all military installations in Canada were to shoot, to kill. These two words, fight and pray, will they mix? Yes, perfectly. There is no more sin in fight than pray. It is equally right to fight or pray when right is in peril. The Presbyterian Record, October 1914. My husband was too old, so during the war, we helped mostly with recruiting. We thought it was quite the right thing for the church to help. My husband's Sunday school class were in their teens. Most of them enlisted. We'd invite them to our house to have some music, one of the boys had a drum, some of the other boys played, and we encouraged them to enlist and be good boys, very good boys. We urged them on. I can never forgive myself. Mrs. Lorna Browning, Arden, Ontario. Hugh's approach to recruiting depended not only on local funding, but on community pressure. Why aren't you in the army? I had difficulty even when I told them I had bad ears because I had scarlet fever. Come on, try again. I tried often enough. They pressure the life out of you. It's hell. Martin Colby. I went to Val Cachet in Civis, the first suit with long pants I'd ever owned. In Val Cachet, we were lousy, but no one would admit it till I said, I'm lousy, are you? Everybody was lousy, and we stayed that way. Bert Remington. Between August 1914 and April 1915, 95,000 men enlisted, as many as the army could absorb. Hughes, starting from scratch, established a camp at Valcacci, both as a training center and staging area. Valcacci camp was located at the juncture of the Jacques Cartier River and the St. Lawrence above Quebec City, a site which also netted the agent who purchased the land in his own name, a healthy commission, and the rank of honorary lieutenant colonel. Hughes handed the chore of building the camp to William Price, who spread the work amongst local conservative contractors. It took 400 workmen 30 days to complete the task, which included installing sewers, water mains, electrical power, railway lines, and three miles of rifle ranges, with the first troops arriving in the midst of construction. Bert Remington, who was brought to Canada by his parents in 1910, was among the first to arrive. We never had any training. I went with an advance guard in September, and there was nothing but field and bush, and we said, but where's the camp? And they said, you're gonna make camp. And that was the beginning of Valcarche. 
and they brought in tents, and the tents went up like mushrooms. That was Valcarche in September 1914. Bert Remington. Two weeks before Remington arrived at Valcartier, Hughes had misinformed Parliament, telling them that 5,000 troops were already there, 5,000 more were on the way, and that the whole complex was ready for their inspection. Rolling to Valcartier, here was a gathering of the clans as a hundred trains converged on Valcartier from every corner of Canada men obtained a new impression of the vastness and breadth of their own land. Here was a country with towering mountain ranges, with prairies two days long, with a sweep of rivers that mingled their sources and flowed into three oceans of the Western world. Simon Graves. By September 8th, 32,665 men had arrived in Valcatier, surpassing Hugh's estimate of 25,000. The composition of the first contingent was 30% Canadian-born, 65% British-born, and 5% other. Valcartier was Hugh's own mini-empire. He would arrive in his private railway car named Roline, in honor of his two daughters, Roby and Aileen. The dominating spirit was General Hughes, who rode about with his aides in great splendor like Napoleon. To me, it seemed that his personality and despotic rule hung like a dark shadow over the camp. Canon Frederick Scott. There was no matter so trivial that it did not warrant Hughes' unwelcome interference. Officers became frequent targets for Hughes' random abuse as likely to find themselves demoted as promoted on the spot. I want men for action. Action, that is the word. I want cool-headed men because it is a terrible responsibility. Incompetent officers are worse than baggage. Sam Hughes. Officers training in the morning before breakfast was sword drill, and we'd go through all the motions of attack and defense with the sword which was the only time we ever used a sword in the course of the war. Ian Sinclair, 13th Battalion. There was some useful training for small arms by drill and route marches, but remembrance of South Africa was strong in the ministerial mind. Rifle ranges three miles long were constructed. Each recruit was expected to aim and discharge his weapon 35 times. The Germans had made the discovery that a recruit never hits the object at which he aims, and their troops were taught to fire as they advanced without aiming, in the hope that they might hit something. But at Valcartier, military training in a general sense was negligible. Dr. Andrew McPhail. A final review of the troops about to depart for Europe took place on September 20th, less than seven weeks after Britain declared war. Among the 9,500 civilians who attended were Prime Minister Borden and his wife. Hughes had just been given the good news from Borden that all 33,000 volunteers would be going overseas with the first contingent, thus releasing him from the painful process of deciding who would go and who would stay. He was silent for a moment, and then he suddenly broke down and sobbed audibly. He presently explained his emotions as joy and relief. He had been, he told me, agonized by the thought of a selection for which he would be responsible, and which he must determine. In reviewing his character and actions, allowances must always be made for his extremely emotional temperament. Robert Borden, Prime Minister. The true Ross rifle was my sporting rifle, which I designed myself. The military rifles turned out at my factory were an official arm over whose structure I had no control. Sir Charles Ross. The Canadian search for a substitute to the British-made Lee Enfield rifle had begun in 1896, when then Minister of Militia and Defence, Sir Frederick Borden, had been refused rights to manufacture the weapon in Canada. When a Canadian order for 15,000 Lee Enfields went unfilled during the Boer War, 
the Canadian government decided it was time to start producing their own weapons, including a rifle to rival the popular Lee Enfield. In 1901, Sir Charles Ross brought his 303 caliber rifle on which he owned a patent to Ottawa in hopes of making the big sale that had so far eluded him. In a series of tests with the Lee Enfield as competition, the Ross was judged to have compared favorably, despite the fact that at one point, Sir Charles was caught tampering with the Lee Enfield. But in one crucial area, the Ross failed ominously, demonstrating a tendency to jam after repeated firings. Despite these findings, the committee unanimously endorsed the Ross rifle, and a factory was built at Quebec City for its manufacture. The British were outraged. The Ross rifle was intended to be lighter and cheaper than the Lee Enfield, but emerged from 80 design changes longer, heavier, and more expensive. I made for the Canadian government, as I was bound to under my 1902 contract, rifles, according to a standard set and frequently changed by the militia department, Sir Charles Ross. Sam Hughes was the great champion of the Ross rifle, calling it the most perfect rifle in every sense in the world today. Hughes rewarded Sir Charles with an honorary colonelcy and a title, consulting officer, small arms, ammunition, and ballistics. Ignoring the fact that the Ross Rifle Factory in Quebec City was having trouble keeping up with orders even before the war began, Sam Hughes placed an order with them for 30,000 rifles plus 30,000 bayonets, complete with scabbards. It was an exceedingly accurate rifle if you could take your time to shoot at one man at about 500 yards. With rapid fire over any lengthy period, say three or four minutes, the darn thing would get heated up so you couldn't open the bolt. H.R. Alley, 3rd Battalion. Another of Hughes' acquisitions was the McAdam Shield Shovel, patented by his private secretary, Ina McAdam. Her father, who owned a foundry, was given a contract to produce it. It was designed to be a combination bulletproof shield and trenching tool, but it was too small to be an effective shield, and the hole in the middle of it made it useless as a shovel. The militia department bought 25,000 at a cost of $1.35 each. They were later sold in bulk as scrap metal to an American company for $1,400. When the Canadians failed to acquire the British-made Vickers machine gun, they purchased the American-made Colt. The Colt tended to jam when British ammunition was used. I can remember one thing they said. If you ever have to leave your gun, all you do is hit it like that and the grip will fall off and it'll mobilize the gun. Well, you didn't have to do that to immobilize it. All you had to do was get a little dirt in it and you could throw it away. Lieutenant Walter Critchley, 10th Battalion. Behind the manufacture of the Ross rifle and other military hardware was the wish to ensure that Canada would receive the industrial benefits resulting from war production. British officials seemed disposed in some instances to obtain supplies from the United States, which could have been procured in Canada, and the provision of which could have given employment to some of our people. On one occasion, I learned that a British official had sent a considerable order to a city in the United States under the impression that he had placed it in Canada. Robert Borden. When Lord Kitchener asked if Hughes could obtain a quantity of 18-pound artillery shells from the Americans, Hughes seized the opportunity and established the Shell Committee to encourage Canadian manufacturers to produce ammunition. By the end of 1915, a total of 422 Canadian plants were sharing in a $30 million industry. Steel production in Canada tripled. Developing and manufacturing the technological tools of war would soon prove an immensely profitable venture. No one who witnessed the departure of the Canadian troops from Valcarche camp will ever forget the sight. The march was some 18 miles by road to Quebec. Women and children came to the doors to cheer them as they passed. The Manitoba Free Press.
To supervise the embarkation, Hughes once again turned to his friend, William Price. It was a chaotic process loading 30 transport ships with freight, 30,000 troops, and 8,000 horses. Aboard the flagship Franconia were 101 Canadian nursing sisters traveling as part of the Canadian Army Medical Corps. The Franconia moved out so quietly about 2 a.m. on October 1st that few realized she had steam up till we woke far down the river. I think it was about 9 a.m., if not earlier, that the first rumors started and lasted till the hour of demobilization. The most steadily abused words of those years were, they say. But on that first morning, they were full of supposed authority and the secret excitement of imagination run riot. Mabel Clint, nursing sister. Sam Hughes followed the contingent in a rented launch to Gaspé Basin, the convoy's departure point for the Atlantic crossing. There, he distributed copies of his pamphlet, Where Duty Serves, and with a megaphone addressed the troops. Soldiers, behind you are loved ones, home, country, with all the traditions of liberty and loyalty, love of king and constitution. You bid adieu to those near and dear to you. You sing, I go then, sweet lass, to win honor and fame. And if I should chance to come gloriously hang, I'll bring a heart to thee with love running o'er. And then I'll leave thee and the homeland no more. Hugh's speech and song were met with a chorus of catcalls and even the Prime Minister drew some satisfaction from the incident. Hughes delivered a flamboyant and grandiloquent address to the troops, based apparently on Napoleon's famous address to the Army of Italy. It did not enhance its prestige, and indeed excited no little mirth in various quarters. Robert Borden. They too had a song for Sam. We are Sam Hughes' army, 30,000 men are we. We cannot fight, we cannot march, what bloody good are we? In August, Hughes had approached Borden, inquiring as to the possibility of leading the troops into battle. Borden had no objection, but turned the matter over to Lord Kitchener, whose reply was a firm, No. But now that the contingent had set sail for England without him, Hughes became frantic. After the departure of the forces, he became obsessed with the desire to visit England. This proposal did not arouse our enthusiasm. Finally, we consented, but not before I had given him warning that he must control his temperament and have no friction with the authorities on the other side. Robert Borden. Hughes immediately raced to New York City to board a liner bound for England, which managed to beat the convoy across the Atlantic so that Hughes was in Plymouth to greet them when they arrived on October 14th. To Canada belongs the immortal distinction of sending the first contingent of Dominion troops to war. Canada has always been foremost in great imperial movements and in advance of the Empire's honor. May the Maple Leaf distinguish itself in many battles. The Plymouth Western Morning News. Nothing like the Canadian contingent has been landed in this country since the time of William the Conqueror, the Times of London. Before we finally got ashore, we were asked to parade through Plymouth, and I was detailed to be a rear party. A dear old lady standing at the side of the road asked, Are you a Canadian? I said, Yes. She said, Where are your feathers? R.F. Haig, Fort Gary Horse. Upon hearing that the Canadian contingent had crossed the Atlantic aboard 30 ships, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany replied, 
die kommen in 30 Ruderbooten wieder zurück. Sie will go back in 30 rowboats. Kaiser Wilhelm. Thirtieth October. Such rain and mud I never saw the like. Fifth November. This is another rotten day. Rain, rain all the time, and such mud cannot do any drill today. Colonel David Watson. Following a seven-hour train ride from Plymouth, which arrived in Lavington at two in the morning, Arthur Curry's 2nd Brigade, carrying full equipment, began a 10-mile march to Salisbury Plain, which would be their home for the next 16 weeks. Exhausted, the troops fell asleep in the waiting tents, with the massive prehistoric pillars and slabs of Stonehenge looming over them. When they awoke, it was raining. And for 89 of the next 123 days, through the cold of winter, it rained. 13th November, still raining and most disagreeable. It is a wonder that most of our men are not sick. 25th November, raining again. I never saw such weather and the mud is so bad, it sucks your rubbers off. 28th November, pouring rain again. This is about the limit. The doctor is complaining about the health of the men. Colonel David Watson. No one tries any longer to keep clean, and we look like barbarians. Everyone wears rubber coats and caps, and we all resemble fishermen. The mud here absolutely beggars description. However, everybody is cheerful, and our English visitors remark that an English regiment would mutiny if it were kept here. Colonel John Creelman, 2nd Field Artillery Brigade. One solution considered was to send the Canadians to Egypt to join the New Zealanders and Australians who had arrived there in December. Eventually, the War Office opted for improving the living conditions by constructing wood frame huts, many of which the Canadians had to build because of a labor shortage in England. The funny thing is, we get into the huts and the sick rate went up by three and four times. In other words, if we were in a constant state of being wet and cold, it didn't affect our health, but when we got into those huts and sat in front of a hot stove and then went out on parade, we chilled. Captain Thomas Morrissey, 13th Battalion. And though an outbreak of meningitis claimed 28 lives, for the most part, the men stood up to these terrible conditions. The horses could not. The artillery had their hands full with their horses. The poor animals floundered lower and lower in the mud. Picket lines had to be changed almost daily, and the task of watering and feeding the horses became a problem in itself. Simon Graves. We hadn't thought of a trench war, and we didn't dig trenches at Valcartier. We were trying to guess what the boys over in Europe would be doing. We were sure that the British Army was the finest and the last word in an army, and all we had to do was to go over there and pick up their ways. Brigadier General Victor Odlum. General Alderson, who was to command the Canadians, was unimpressed during the early stages of training. But after two months, and despite the weather playing havoc with training conditions, he declared the infantry to be in excellent shape. When Sam Hughes learned that Lord Kitchener was planning to distribute the Canadians amongst British regiments, he stormed into Kitchener's office. Sir, do I understand you to say that you are going to break up these Canadian regiments that came over? Why, it will kill recruiting in Canada. Kitchener answered, you have your orders, carry them out. And I replied, I'll be damned if I will. Turned on my heel and marched out. Sam Hughes. Hughes had an unfailing gift for attracting the attention of the press. If the struggle is not over by spring, I will take the field myself. Sam Hughes. If this country had to face the enemy with such a leader, the cry of, oh God, our help in ages past, would drown out the noise of the guns. The Toronto Evening News. One member of parliament wrote Borden, 
His latest utterances in London last night compel me to take the charitable view that the man is insane. Borden, in an attempt to rid himself of Hughes, wired George Purley, Canada's High Commissioner. In case Hughes should be desirous of going to the front, it would be advisable from a political consideration to give him the opportunity. Robert Borden. On February 4th, 1915, King George inspected the troops, a sure sign that a departure was imminent. At the beginning of November, I had the pleasure of welcoming to the mother country this fine contingent from the Dominion of Canada. And now, after three months training, I bid you Godspeed on your way to assist my army in the field. I am well aware of the discomforts that you have experienced from the inclement weather and abnormal rain, and I admire the cheerful spirit displayed by all ranks in facing and overcoming all difficulties. By your deeds and achievements on the field of battle, I am confident that you will emulate the example of your fellow countrymen in the South African War. I shall follow with pride and interest all your movements. I pray that God may bless you and watch over you. King George V. Ihr werdet wieder zu Hause sein, ehe die Blätter von den Bäumen fallen. You will be home before the leaves have fallen from the trees. Kaiser Wilhelm. The Canadians were about to join a war that was everybody's making and nobody's choosing. The prevailing attitude among the European powers was that the war would be short and would end quickly and decisively. One dissenting viewpoint was expressed to the Kaiser as early as 1905 by General Helmut von Moltke, who would lead the German assault in the West. It will become a war between peoples, which is not to be concluded with a single battle, but which will be a long, weary struggle with a country that will not acknowledge defeat until the whole strength of its people is broken. A war that even if we should be the victors, will push our own people to the limits of exhaustion. General von Moltke. The German blueprint for victory, the Schlieffen Plan, named after the strategist who had created it, called for a large force invasion through Belgium and into northern France, outflanking French forces north and east of Paris. The German offensive was, at first, an apparent success, as German forces swept through most of Belgium and far into France. But von Moltke was uneasy. Don't let's deceive ourselves. The victor should have prisoners. Where are our prisoners? General von Moltke. The general then made a critical deviation from the Schlieffen plan. He pulled his right-hand troops east of Paris, leaving his flank vulnerable to attack by the French and British. On September 7th, the Allies counterattacked the Germans at the River Marne, forcing them to retreat. The massive German assault had violated the neutrality of Belgium, guaranteed by all major European powers when that nation was created in 1839. The German offensive had failed because of the stubborn defense of the Belgians, the fighting retreat of Britain's small but growing army, but chiefly because of the remarkable recovery of the French at the Marne. The Germans now dug a line of fortifications extending from the channel just inside Belgium through Flanders into France to the Swiss border. The defensive positions everywhere were on high ground of their choosing. Trenches were dug, Barbed wire, invented in 1880 by American ranchers, was erected, and machine guns, a new weapon, strategically placed to lay down a withering fire against any advance. Aircraft, used for the first time in war, made surprise all but impossible. The German grand strategy was to wait behind these positions until Russia was defeated. The push to Paris would then be resumed with the armies from the east giving them numerical superiority. 
Meanwhile, they would engage their enemies in such a way as to weaken rather than defeat them. As decreed by the famous 18th century military strategist, Karl von Clausewitz, the decisive weapon would be massed artillery, which would create a killing ground within which, in Clausewitz's words, the enemy must advance and seek his own destruction. As a special distinction, the wards were named after Canadian provinces, Quebec, Ontario, and Nova Scotia occupying the ground floor. Mabel Clint, nursing sister. The honor of being the first Canadian military force to cross the English Channel to France actually belonged to nurses of the number two stationary hospital, which opened in Le Touquet Hotel on November 27th. The number of beds was 420. Every member of the staff was on his or her mettle, for we felt Canadian efficiency might be judged by this sample of organization and training. Mabel Clint, nursing sister. But the first Canadians to reach the front were the Princess Patricia's Light Infantry, composed almost entirely of British-born veterans. They landed in France on December 21st and joined the British 27th Division. In mid-February, 19 ships conveying Canadian troops departed from Avonmouth on the west coast of England, destined for Saint-Nazaire on the mouth of the Loire. The trip should have taken 36 hours, but because of a severe storm, the crossing lasted a miserable five days. Upon arrival, the sea-weary troops were given a rousing welcome, the first non-regular British division to reach France. Troops boarded trains at Saint-Nazaire for a 43-hour endurance test to the front. Officers traveled in passenger cars up front, while the regular troops were packed in boxcars at the back. The trip ended in French Flanders, where they billeted in the nearby villages and farms. And as foreign as this land seemed to them, one thing remained the same. The mud here is as thick and much stickier than at Salisbury Plains, but nobody minds now. Colonel John Creelman, 2nd Field Artillery Brigade. On March 1st, the Canadians relieved the British near Fleur Bay. British General Edwin Alderson took command of the Canadian 1st Division on March 3rd and addressed his troops, betraying a bias to the defense. My old regiment, the Royal West Kent, has been here since the beginning of the war and it has never lost a trench. The army says the West Kents never budge. I am proud of the great record of my old regiment and I think it is a good omen. I now belong to you and you belong to me and before long the army will say the Canadians never budge. General Edwin Alderson. The Canadians were just in time for the Neuve Chapelle Offensive, an attack by four British divisions south and east of the Belgian city of Ypres. The Canadians, used mostly in a supporting role, nevertheless suffered 278 casualties from German artillery during a quiet period in the line lasting 24 days. New problems with the Ross rifle surfaced. The bayonets tended to fall off if attached when fired exposing soldiers to sniper fire as they attempted to retrieve them from in front of the parapet. The great bulk of our men got down into the trenches or ditches or anything low because you avoided the bullets by doing that. But you didn't avoid the gas, you took it. And when you saw men suffering, dying with the gas, oh, it was a pitiful thing. I stayed up in the high spots. I would rather have the bullets than the gas. Colonel Victor Odlum. The German strategy, while defensive, had two points at which they continued to exert a more or less continuous pressure in an attempt to wear down the forces opposing them. In the south, the position was Verdun, where French General Pétain had decreed, they shall not pass and in the north in Belgium at Ypres, which the British were forced to defend in order to protect the channel ports of Dunkirk and Calais, through which their forces 
could most directly enter France. More than half the casualties sustained by all the armies engaged in the Western Front would occur at Ypres and Verdun. At Ypres, German attempts at encirclement of the British position created what is called the Ypres salient. Its essential shape was complete by the fall of 1914. The British action at Neuve Chapelle had been designed to enlarge the salient and had failed, with a large cost in men. The Allied defense line slightly north of the village of Saint-Julien was flat, muddy, and separated from the Germans by only a few hundred yards. On the left of the Canadians was a French colonial division made up of troops from Algeria. These troops, along with the Canadians, had been chosen to endure the world's first gas attacks, undoubtedly because the Germans had a low opinion of colonial troops. The chlorine gas from 5,000 cylinders was released mainly against the Algerians on April 22nd. The green-yellow curtain, when it reached their lines, choked on contact, killing or incapacitating any of its victims who continued to breathe the gas into their lungs. The Algerians fled, leaving a four-mile gap on the Canadian left. When this gas attack came up, we saw these Algerian fellows running really running. Poor fellows, the rifle fire they were good on, but when these big shells, ton and a half shells, were bursting and the gas, that was really too much for them. FC Arnold, 7th Battalion. We weren't equipped with a gas mask. Men were coughing, spitting and choking, and we didn't know what to do till the MO of the 14th Battalion, Colonel Scrimger, was rushing up and down telling everyone to urinate on your pocket handkerchief tie it over your mouth, and you save thousands of lives. Lieutenant Joseph Sproston, artillery. The Germans were slow to take advantage of the unprecedented gap in the Allied lines. Brigadier General Turner, commander of the 3rd Brigade, ordered an attack at midnight by the 10th and 16th Battalions against the Germans now moving through the gap. It was a bayonet charge. There was a hedge a short distance ahead of us, about four feet six high, with a wire through it. This was heavy wire, so when we hit that, it just stopped everything. There was no talking, no work, but with our entrenching tool and bayonet scabbards and rifle butts, that created a great deal of noise. Dan Ormond, 10th Battalion. Those sort of noises carry a long way at night. And the next thing we knew, a very light went up that lit up the whole countryside. Then it just opened up, rapid fire with rifles and machine guns, which is pretty ugly. And to green troops, it was an appalling experience. A.M. McClellan, 16th Battalion. But the Canadians pushed on, attacking and finally overwhelming the Germans defending a shallow trench. We had taken the Germans by surprise. They had never thought any army would ever think of doing anything like that. We routed them out of their trenches, and we captured a batter of 18-pounder guns the British had left behind. Lieutenant Walter Critchley, 10th Battalion. By the evening of the 23rd, they had been reduced to company strength. At nightfall, the 3rd Brigade withdrew to stronger ground on the western end of the Gravenstaffel Ridge. Though severely bloodied and battered, the Canadians had bought time to close the flank, barring the pathway to Ypres. De Weltkrieg, official German history of the war, credited the obstinate resistance and tenacious determination of the Canadians with robbing them of victory. Arthur Curry, the commander of the 2nd Brigade, had been in the midst of the fighting, his first direct experience of war. The Allied line had bent, but it had not broken. And along with their contribution in stemming the German advance, the Canadians still held the line which they had been assigned. On the morning of April 24th, it became the site of the world's second gas attack. It swept over the 8th Battalion of Curry's 2nd Brigade. But unlike the Algerians two days earlier, the Canadians were not caught by surprise and fought stubbornly. I 
I saw the Germans hop over their trenches and put these cans in front. I wondered what they were doing. Just one here and one a little further along. And the smoke from that boiled up, and the wind blew it towards us. I thought it was smoke. And then when it came along towards us, it turned green, a greeny yellow color. It came up and went over the trenches, and two fellows, one on my right and one on my left, they dropped and they both died. But I could swim underwater for two minutes. And as soon as I saw that gas coming, I tied a handkerchief over my nose and mouth, and that saved my life. Lester Stevens, 8th Battalion. Brigadier General Turner's brigade, weakened by its defense of the abandoned French position two days earlier, threatened to collapse. Turner was ordered to use British units to fill and hold his line for the massive attack which was expected to follow after the gas and artillery had taken their toll. Unfortunately, Turner interpreted the line to mean the secondary line, which lay more than a mile behind his present position. When he pulled out his troops, he left the left flank of Curry's 2nd Brigade exposed. Thinking Curry must have received a similar order, he did not inform him of his intentions. Curry, worried about his collapsing left, sent for reinforcements. When none came, he left his post and went to divisional headquarters to personally fetch reinforcements. While on his mission to HQ, Curry learned that Turner and Brigade Major Garnet Hughes had withdrawn the 3rd Brigade and that his troops were outflanked. A now desperate Curry confronted Major General Snow, commander of the British 27th Division. As soon as I mentioned that apparently there was a gap between the left of my 8th Battalion and the 3rd Brigade troops, Major General Snow shouted at me and asked me how I dare allow a gap to occur. To hear him, one would have thought that I was personally and solely responsible. Arthur Curry. One witness to the scene was Lieutenant Lynn of the 2nd Field Company. General Curry was cool and adamant. General Snow, in contrast, was excited, raving, abusive, and insulting. Lieutenant Lynn, 2nd Field Company. Curry's trip to headquarters would come to haunt him. His enemies, later to include Sam Hughes, would use it against him in a campaign of whispered innuendo to suggest a cowardice in the face of the enemy. Major General Snow was of the same opinion. If Curry was an English officer, I would have had him put under arrest and he would probably have been shot. General Thomas Snow. Returning to his brigade, Curry mustered together men from the 7th and 10th battalions, a total of only 300 men, and put them under the command of Victor Odlum, still mourning the death of his brother killed in battle only the day before. Odlum's men took their places in the line during the night to the left of Lipset's 8th battalion to form a most precarious flank. The Germans attacked, wiping out an entire company of the 8th Battalion. I concluded that our position had been judged hopeless and ordered units to retire at dusk. Arthur Curry. During this retirement, with the Germans yelling behind them, drums beating and calling out, we have got you Canadians now, I never saw a man quicken his step. Colonel Tuxford, 5th Battalion. Arthur Curry and the Canadians had been in their first battle, and while there were criticisms of Curry, the Canadian infantry had held their ground in the crucial first three days under conditions that were unprecedented and protected the all-important left flank of the British position. Their stand against a ghastly new weapon had earned them a special kind of recognition and respect. The Canadian stand at Ypres had relieved gas of its psychological impact. It was now only another of the known horrors of war, and with the introduction of gas masks shortly afterwards, it lost some of its physical impact as well. Sir Basil de Del Hart, military historian. At Saint-Julien, the Canadians would eventually erect a monument to their first battle victory. More than 6,000 casualties were suffered by the Canadians, and one of these casualties, Lieutenant Alex Helmer, killed by a direct hit from an eight-inch shell, had a powerful emotional impact on his friend, a Canadian doctor serving at Ypres, John McCrae. Heavy gunfire this morning. 
Lieutenant Helmer was killed at the guns. His diary's last words were, it has quieted a little and I shall try to get a good sleep. I said the committal service over him as well as I could from memory. A soldier's death. Dr. John McCray, Captain, Medical Corps. The next day, less than a mile from where the Canadian memorial to the battle still stands, McCray took a few minutes between treating batches of wounded soldiers to jot down a poem. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived. Felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up your quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. It is little wonder then that in Flanders fields has become the poem of the army. The soldiers have learned it with their hearts, which is quite a different thing from committing it to memory. It circulates as a song should circulate, by the living word of mouth, not by printed characters. Dr. Andrew McPhail. The slaughter of friends and half his brigade at the Second Battle of Ypres had changed McCrae forever. He seldom took leave and insisted on living in tents like the frontline troops, despite his deteriorating health. He would die of pneumonia in January of 1918. For him, the war had to be won. He could not break faith with the dead of Flanders. The message of in Flanders fields was uncompromising. John F. Prescott. Dear Grace, one sees some rather dreadful sights in this place, which it pays to forget about as quickly as possible and not to write about it all. So I try to remember only the nice things. I guess we won't have much tennis this year. By the way, I'm getting to be quite a French linguist. I hope to be quite efficient before long, and when I see you again, I'll be quite too much for you. Alfred Bastido. The news of their heroic stand was received with great pride, and Canadians realized that their country had decisively stepped onto the world stage. Then came the casualty list. Beneath a banner headline, Canada Forever and Forever, were the names of the gallant men who had fallen in battle. In Pembroke, the long list was posted in the window of the telegraph office on Main Street. People stood in the street to read it. There was silence and deep sorrow. At the top of the list was the name Captain Alfred Bastido, killed in action. Grace Morris. And for some, there was a fear equal to that of their own death. I'm not by nature intrepid, not even quarrelsome enough to make fighting enjoyable. On the contrary, I shrink from the naked disclosure of human passions, drunkenness, insanity, hatred, anger. They fill me with a cold horror and dread. But to see a man afraid would be the worst of all. To have to kill a man in whose eyes I saw the wild fear of death would be awful. I almost think I would stop and let the fellow kill me instead. Talbot Papineau. After firing 15 to 30 rounds rapid fire, the rifles jam. To loosen the bolt, it was necessary to use the boot heel or the handle of an entrenching tool. The men have lost confidence in the Ross rifle as a service arm. Lieutenant Colonel Loomis, 13th Battalion. Following the Second Battle of Ypres, questions regarding the worthiness of the Ross rifle for combat were once again raised. Out of 5,000 surviving infantrymen, 1,452 had thrown away their Ross rifles and picked up Lee Enfields from their fallen British comrades. 
General Alderson forwarded reports submitted by Canadian battalion and brigade commanders on the performance of the Ross rifle to Sir John French. This matter is as delicate as it is important. Canada will no doubt be extremely annoyed if fault is found with the rifle. This cannot be allowed to stand in the way when the question may be of life and death and of victory and defeat. General Edwin Alderson. French ordered that the 1st Division be rearmed with Lee Enfields, but allowed that the 2nd Division, when it arrived, would keep the Ross rifle, so long as a steady supply of the proper Canadian-made ammunition was available. With the arrival of the 2nd Division overseas, Sam Hughes decided it was time that the Canadians created a separate Canadian Corps, preferably with himself in charge. On Hughes' urging, Sir John French recommended the creation of a Canadian Corps to General Douglas Haig, who would soon replace French as commander of the British Army in France. Haig complied and made General Alderson Corps commander. I think the best return we can make for the splendid service rendered by the Canadian Division is to meet their wishes. Sir John French. Alderson opened Canadian Corps HQ in Bayeux on September 13th, and in a complete vindication of Arthur Curry's actions during the Second Battle of Ypres, placed him in charge of the 1st Division. Sam Hughes received a knighthood on August 24th, 1915, after intense lobbying on his behalf from Borden, Max Aitken, and fellow Canadian and future British Prime Minister Bonar Law, the new colonial secretary but over the objections of the Duke of Connaught, who was already concerned over allegations against Hughes regarding wartime profiteering. Hughes also sought to get his son, Garnet, promoted to Brigadier General in command of Curry's old brigade. Hughes' representative in England, Max Aitken, the Canadian who had become a press baron and rose to the peerage as Lord Beaverbrook, leaked it to the papers that Garnet's commission was already a done deal. Alderson was livid at the suggestion that it had been his idea. I am told that it has been published in the Canadian papers that I especially asked for Hughes to be made a brigadier. I do not think this is right or fair. To say that I asked specifically for him is putting me in a very wrong position with several gallant commanding officers who have done real, solid, good work. General Edwin Alderson. Max Aiken warned Alderson that he was putting his position with Sam Hughes at risk, and Alderson was soon replaced as Corps Commander. But Alderson was not alone in his low opinion of Garnet Hughes, whose failure to inform Curry of the withdrawal of the 3rd Brigade at Ypres had exposed Curry's left flank to the enemy. Tonight I have 100 stretchers and 150 bearers, and we are going to try and get them out. It is a wonder how any of us escaped and it will take a couple of days to get the casualties out of the line. Major Agar Adamson, Princess Patricia, Light Infantry. At the beginning of June, the Canadian 3rd Division, under General David Mercer, held a two and a half mile line from Hill 60 on the right, across Mount Sorel, Hill 61, Hill 62, through Sanctuary Wood, across the Gap, to the village of Hoog on the left. On June 2nd, 1916, the Germans unleashed an artillery barrage so savage in its intensity that it blew the Canadian troops right out of their trenches. Four mines exploded under Mount Sorel, added to the devastation. Wave after wave of German infantry advanced, quickly overcoming any resistance. In Sanctuary Wood, the Princess Pats, now part of the Canadian 3rd Division, fought desperately to hold the flank against a determined German attack. We have lost about 480 men, but it is impossible yet to say precisely how many. The only officers now with the regiment are Gray, McPherson, Dunton, Mackenzie, all up to daylight this morning unwounded. The bombardment today has been very heavy and I fear our casualties will be added to. General Mercer, Victor Williams, McLaren, ADC to Victor and Goodenham, blown up by a mine explosion. Victor was badly wounded at the time. 
The Germans report having captured a general and staff. It is imagined that this refers to them. I find myself now in command of the regiment, and I don't feel I have the knowledge or physical strength to do this remnant of a regiment justice. I would like Gray to take it, as ability should be considered before seniority. Goodbye, old girl. I am rather done and played out. Major Agar Adamson, Princess Patricia, Light Infantry. By 2 p.m., the Germans had captured Mount Sorel, Hills 61 and 62, and penetrated 1,200 yards into the Canadian front. The Germans were now two miles from Ypres, and Haig seriously questioned the Canadians' performance. This goes to prove that men with strange equipment and rugged countenances and beards are not all determined fighters. General Sir Douglas Haig. General Julian Bing, who had replaced General Alderson as Canadian Corps commander, gave the task of retaking Mount Sorel to Curry, who worked on a new battle plan calling for coordination between artillery and ground troops and the use of constant air reconnaissance to keep abreast of shifting German defenses. Tell the officers and men that we intend that the artillery will knock the fight out of the enemy. Our chief work is to consolidate quickly and hold on. Arthur Curry. We were faced with the woods which had been shelled to pieces. The stumps were all there and were full of barbed wire. And in driving rain and pitch dark, it would be very easy to lose direction. So I recommended to the CO that we do the thing with the bayonet without any shooting at all. In the first place, we wouldn't be shooting each other, but the great thing would be that if there were rifle flashes, we would know it was the Germans. So we did it that way, with cold steel. H.R. Alley, 3rd Battalion. In an hour, all objectives were in Canadian hands. On the 14th, the enemy mounted two counterattacks, which were quickly repulsed. Though Canadian losses during the 12 days of battle were nearly twice those of the Germans, this first set-piece battle planned and executed by the Canadian Corps had been an enormous success. Curry, in salvaging victory from defeat, had begun to develop his signature strategy of paying the price for victory in shells and not in the lives of his men. And in the aftermath of the battle, a final decision was made to replace the Ross rifle. I carried in three Lee Enfield rifles to the infantry in the front line. It was a Canadian Scottish battalion and I saw this kilty up on the firing step, so I said to him, Hey, Jock, you want a Lee Enfield rifle? And he looked down in the half-light, unbelieving, grabbed it, picked up his own rifle, waved it around his head, and slung it out to no man's land. A.G. Jacobs, LSHG. In March 1917, the Ross factory was expropriated by the Canadian government, and in October, Sir Charles Ross relinquished his appointment as consulting officer, small arms, ammunition, and ballistics, and along with it, his honorary rank of colonel. The fall of the Ross rifle would mark the beginning of the end for Sam Hughes. I do not like to kick a man when he is down, but I am willing to break nine toes in kicking Sam. Colonel John Creelman, 2nd Field Artillery Brigade. The Ross rifle and the trench shovel had been pet projects of Hughes, their manufacture placed in the hands of cronies. But so too was most of Canada's war production. The virtual absence of French Canadians among the country's financial and industrial elite meant that French Canadians saw themselves pilloried for their lack of patriotism, while the English owners of industry and friends of the Minister of Militia and Defence became rich. The new scandal of 1916 revolved around Hughes' association with J. Wesley Allison and his creation of the Shell Committee. Allison, made an honorary colonel by Hughes, had originally served as a freelance purchasing agent for the committee. Together with three American speculators, Allison set up the American Ammunition Company at a cost of $3,000. Allison, in his role as purchasing agent for the committee, then placed orders with his own company for artillery fuses amounting to $10 million, using an advance of $1,500,000 from the committee 
to establish a factory and provide working capital. The speculators then paid healthy kickbacks to Allison. Borden appointed a royal commission to investigate and asked Hughes, who was in England, to return to Canada. In July, the Royal Commission finished their report. Allison was given a slap on the wrist and lost his honorary rank given to him by Hughes and was cleared of any wrongdoing. The dust had been conveniently swept under the carpet. On November 9, 1916, Borden, who had never fired a cabinet minister before, asked Hughes for his resignation. I have done my utmost to support you in the administration of your department. This has been very difficult by reason of your strong tendency to assume powers which you do not possess. My time and energies, although urgently needed for more important duties, have been very frequently employed in removing difficulties thus unnecessarily created. Robert Borden. For a long time, I have closed my eyes to the petty intrigues and ambitions about me. I leave with regret, not on account of the office or anything special, but for the welfare of the soldiers. However, a kindly, watchful eye will be kept over them by your humble servant, Sam Hughes. Sam Hughes had his detractors, as well as supporters. Sam Hughes was the father and the mother of that formation we sent overseas. Without Sam Hughes, it never would have gone. I consider Sam the biggest single contribution Canada made to the war. Brigadier General Victor Odlin. It wouldn't have surprised any of us if somebody had assassinated Sam Hughes. DHC Mason, 3rd Battalion. In a parting shot at Borden, Hughes noted how history might compare them. It might be well if we could all possess your soft mannerism, but I am very much afraid, judging by all periods of history, that human liberty and human progress would not make much advance under such diplomatic forms. Sam Hughes. Apart from the creation of the world's largest ever volunteer army, Hughes, on the recommendation of his son Garnet, had plucked Canada's only authentic military genius, Arthur Curry, from retirement to lead a brigade, even though more than once, Curry had refused to follow Hughes' orders. True to the manner in which he lived, the last speech that Sam Hughes would ever give in the House of Commons before his death in 1921 was a heartfelt call for a return to the system of patronage. Grace Morris, in the company of her mother, sailed to England to visit her brother Ramsey of the 38th Battalion, hospitalized with shell shock and temporary blindness, the result of a severe shelling in the trenches. The week spent in England opened our eyes to some of the realities of trench warfare. Adventure and glamour obviously had no part in it. The intelligent young men with whom we had talked over the dinner table in London avoided all reference to the unspeakable horrors and wretched discomforts. These were things they endured. Their only hope and purpose was to survive and bring it all to a successful conclusion. I found that the letters from France, which had been kept with care, meant even more to me now that I understood better the conditions under which they had been written. Grace Morris. On the various battlefields and cemeteries around Ypres lie thousands of men with no known grave. After the war, the British raised a memorial to 55,000 British Dominion and colonial soldiers who had perished without trace. The last post is still played there daily, as it has been since its inaugural. British poet Siegfried Sassoon, who had fought at Ypres, saw it as an affront and replied in a poem. Who will remember passing through this gate 
the unheroic dead who fed the guns? Who will absolve the foulness of their fate, those doomed, conscripted, unvictorious ones? Crudely renewed, the salient holds its own, paid are its nin defenders by this pomp, paid with a pile of peace-complacent stone, the armies who endured that sullen swamp. Here was the world's worst wound, and here with pride. Their name liveth forever, the gateway claims. Was ever an immolation so belied as these intolerably nameless names? Well might the dead who struggled in the slime rise and deride this sepulchre of crime. Siegfried Sassoon. The determined and costly stand of the Allies at Ypres and at Verdun did little to bring about victory, but they had avoided defeat. In this most terrible of trials, the Canadians had made a point that perhaps only they could make. There were some who recalled with anxiety the scientific organization and the tireless patience with which Germany had set herself to create the most superb military instrument which the world has ever seen. And they may have been forgiven if they asked themselves, can civilians, however brave and intelligent, be made in a few months the equals of those inspired veterans who were swarming in triumph over the battlefields of Europe? These were formidable questions, and even a bold man might have shrunk from a confident answer. The story of Canada in Flanders would make it unnecessary ever to ask them again. Lord Beaverbrook. In 1916, the killing fields of Ypres, predetermined by the strategy of defense, would give way to the equally dreadful experience of the Somme, as the British, including the Canadians and Newfoundlanders, moved to the attack, culminating in the Battle of Vimy Ridge. <laughs> 